Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. You've been waiting for it. It's finally here. It's the election of 1848, which I could probably describe like this. You ever been in your family room if you have a pet and the dog takes a dump in the other room and everybody pretends not to smell it? That's the election of 1848. Only the dump is the issue of slavery. So let's see who our candidates are. Let's see what the campaign issues are. Let's see what the Electoral College map looks like. And let's see if we can't giddy up for the learning. Let's go get her done right now. So with James K. Polk living up to his word, which was that he was only gonna run for one term, he steps down and then he dies. We have an open election. We have our Whigs, we have our Democrats, and we're gonna get the bubblings of a new party, not the Republicans yet, but it's gonna be called the Free Soil Party. Let's take a look at the Whigs. Now, the Whigs only had one winner previously. That was William Henry Harrison, famous general, fought the Native Americans, and then he died. So this is their second stab at it, and after running numerous candidates that failed previously, senators and legislators and such like that, they decided to go for another war hero. So they pick Louisiana slave owner Zachary Taylor, who has no political experience, and he hasn't even voted in an election. In fact, his stances on the issues were always muddled, always kind of unclear, and he was kind of a weird candidate to be a Whig. The Whig is primarily a northern party, and here is this general from the South. He is the hero of Palta Alta, of Monterey, and you have to remember that James K. Polk was a Democrat and he launched that Mexican War. The Whigs were against the war, but now that the treaty has been signed and the United States suddenly finds itself with all of this new cool land in the Southwest, we got California and Nevada and Utah and Colorado, there's all these states, they're all coming into the Union. The Whigs start to kind of push towards acceptance that maybe this wasn't a bad thing. Now, Zachary Taylor, actually fought in the Mexican War. So it's kind of ironic he's going to be the Whig candidate after fighting a Democratic war that the Whigs opposed. In fact, Zachary Taylor was courted by both political parties. But when it comes to the vice presidential nominee, his first nominee choice was actually Daniel Webster from Massachusetts, who really wanted to be president really bad, but he thought he would do a better job in Congress, so he turned it down. Psych! You should have took the job you would have been president. But it's pretty clear Zachary Taylor is gonna be the candidate and he chooses as his vice presidential nominee. And you wanna pay attention because all of the Whigs die. So the vice presidential nominees become really important. And this is gonna be a Whig from my hometown of Buffalo, New York, Millard Fillmore, who's gonna do an awful job as president. But there we go, we have our Whigs. The Whigs are a Northern party running a slave owning Zachary Taylor from Louisiana. And we're really gonna watch them kind of dance around the issue of slavery. All right, we got one party locked up, the Whigs. Let's see who the Democrats are gonna put up at the plate. Bring in the Democrats. Now, the Democrat that wanted the nomination is Martin Van Buren. This guy will just not go away. He is a Northern Democrat. He wants to be the Democratic nominee, but he's turned away, primarily because of his support for the Wilmot Provision, which would have banned slavery out West with all of these new territories. That made him, in the eyes of the South, unacceptable. They end up going with Lewis Cass from Michigan, who, like many of these Democrats, are gonna support the concept of popular sovereignty. He chooses for his vice presidential nominee, William Orlando Butler from Kentucky, who is pretty pro-slavery. And that's going to force some of the Northern Democrats to have a problem with this ticket as well. So at the end of the day, you have a Democratic Party, which is based in the South, running a Northerner, and a Whig Party based in the North, running a Southerner. I'm getting confused talking about it. But like the Whigs, the Democrats are also going to try to avoid this issue of slavery, really focusing on their opposition to the National Bank, their their opposition to tariffs and infrastructure spending, as well as their you know fierce loyalty to the concept of states' rights, the Jeffersonian Republican idea. Lewis Cass was Andrew Jackson's Secretary of War. He has deep roots in the Democratic Party, and the Democratic Party doesn't want to lose the North, so they're going to run a Northerner with this Michiganian. Is Michiganian a word? I don't think so. But also the vice presidential nominee is from Kentucky, so they see this as a balanced ticket, and they're going to go for the win. Unfortunately, spoiler alert. So the spoiler is going to be Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren is done. 
He is not going to let Lewis Cass, this Democrat with his ideas of popular sovereignty, win the election. And he knows as a third party candidate he can't win, but he's willing to throw this election to the Whig Party. So he bands together with some of the Liberty Party members like Samuel Chase and Charles Sumner from Massachusetts and other Northern Democrats that are opposed to popular sovereignty, some Northern Whigs as well, and they form what is now called the Free Soil Party. They support the Wilmont Provision. They they don't want slavery to expand. Martin Van Buren is fiercely opposed to popular sovereignty and what he calls the two parties' dominance of slave power. So he is literally going to split the vote in the North with the Democratic Party and throw this election to the Whigs, primarily in New York. So we have Martin Van Buren. His vice presidential nominee is none other than, drumroll, Charles Adams Sr., who is the son and grandson of two presidents, pretty famous guy. But we are going to see some of these free soilers, like Samuel Chase of Ohio, win and go to the Senate. Charles Sumner of Massachusetts ends up going to the Senate. And what we've just done, guys, is we've planted the seeds of the Republican Party. Now, Abraham Lincoln, he's going to campaign for the Whigs, but soon enough, he's going to be pulled over to those free soil or soon, and you start to see the history of Foreman. All right, we have our three major candidates now, and they're all lined up, and we're going to talk about the campaign. How about the candidates? Old Rough and Ready, that's what they called Zachary Taylor, the old you-know-what. And his slogan was without regard to principle or creed. This is a guy who really is an independent. He's probably more of a Democrat than a Whig at the end of the day. He's a unionist. He's for the National Bank. He's for protected tariffs, but he's also for states' rights and he's against infrastructure spending. He believes in the Wilmot provision, we think, but he's willing to compromise on the issue of slavery. In fact, it'll be Millard Fillmore, his vice president, that ends up signing the Fugitive Slave Act, which pushes us to the brink of civil war. So Zachary Taylor is running very much a personality-driven campaign, negative attacks. He's really not campaigning. His surrogates are doing that, like Rutherford B. Hayes and Abraham Lincoln. Now, the Democrats and Lewis Cass they're also avoiding this issue of slavery, trying to hold this coalition of Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats together. They're for popular sovereignty. You have to remember, it was the Democratic Party. It's really theirs to lose. James K. Polk, even though you might not know his name very well, was very successful in terms of what he set out to do. His domestic policy, and I guess his foreign policy, was to annex Texas. That started a war with Mexico. We gobbled up lots of land because of that. And, you know, the Democrats are responsible for that. That. However, he is not going to run, so they're stuck with this Lewis Cass, who's less of a well-known name. He's from Michigan, and he's trying to appeal to Southern Democrats. And at the same time, you have Northern Democrats that are very turned off by a pro-slavery vice presidential nominee from Kentucky. So that's the campaign. And of course, we have that spoiler in Martin Van Buren. He's running a campaign in the North only. He's not even on the ballot in every state across the country. There's no way he can win this thing. But he's pounding the pavement, talking about slave power, his opposition to popular sovereignty, and the idea that we can't have slavery expand. So there we go, guys. Let's put up the big electoral map that you love to stare at all day, and let's see if we can figure out why Zachary Taylor is going to be the second and the last elected Whig president. Whigs did a smarty picking a southerner because it counts where you're from. You can see from the electoral map there that Zachary Taylor is going to win not only northern states but southern states as well. At the end of the day, he racks up 163 electoral votes, Lewis Cass 127 electoral votes, and wah, 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 Martin Van Buren doesn't win any electoral votes. Now, the popular vote was really close. Uh, Zachary Taylor won the popular vote with about 47% of the vote to 42.5%. 5% for Lewis Cass, but 10% of the popular vote went to Martin Van Buren. And at the, at the end of the day, if Martin Van Buren doesn't run those 36 electoral votes in New York, they go to Lewis Cass, and he's the next president of the United States. So Martin Van Buren got his wish. He was a spoiler, and he threw it to the Whigs. Now, we know what happened. Zachary Taylor, like all Whig presidents, Zachary Taylor is going to die, and he's not going to be successful in accomplishing what he wanted to accomplish in solving this problem of slavery and these new southwestern states coming into the Union. That's going to be put into the lap of Millard Fillmore, and he's only going to be around for about three years, and then we're going to get rid of him as well. Out of here, Millard Fillmore, go back to Buffalo. You know nothing. It's an inside joke. 
All right, guys, we hope you understand something about the 1848 election. I want to give a shout out. How about the kids at Station High School in Gatlin, Tennessee? Seth Massey, you must be one incredible teacher. I know your kids are eating up the history. All right, guys, where attention goes, energy flows. We're going to see you guys next time that you press my buttons and you grow your brain.